Or was Charlie Chaplin a bad person? Was Charlie Chaplin a bad person? Who's the real Charlie Chaplin? <laughs> Similar <laughs> question. <laughs> Hi, we're Peter and James, the directors of The Real Charlie Chaplin, and we're really pleased to be here on Face to Face. Here we go. To dive in. <laughs> How did it feel to watch your finished film for the first time? Mixed emotions, I think, if we're being honest, right? Everything got delayed and, and, and pushed back and pushed back. But yeah, so to see it, uh, I guess, was uh, in some part relief, but also just, yeah, I guess you know, it's, it's, it's a huge... It's, it's a special thing to see it with an audience and, and that's the first time that you get a chance to kind of watch it through people's eyes and you feel the vibe in the room and um, yeah, complicated I think is the short answer. <laughs> You've worked with each other for some time. What's the skill you most benefit from each other? Oh, um, we have. We've been working together for over 10 years now. We're kind of, I mean, filmmaking can be quite a lonely, <laughs> lonely pursuit, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, long, it's a long road and there's some fairly kind of dark hours at times when you're staring at the kind of uh, a sea of materials and struggling to make sense from it. So to have that sense of sort of companionship, to be able to, to share, that, share those puzzles and challenges and successes together, I think is, is, is really important. Yeah, I agree. How would you describe the character of the real person, Charlie Chaplin, and not the figure? Oh, well, I mean, that's, that is, I think, the central question of the film and one that we've been trying to puzzle over for the last few years actually. I mean everyone has an image of Charlie Chaplin in their head. I think even today like we we did um, workshops when we were making the film with with, with, with school kids and, um, and we showed pictures of Charlie Chaplin and everyone in the room knew that figure with the with the moustache and the, the cane and the, and the hat. As soon as you watch his films you feel a connection with him. Um, you feel that intimacy when he looks at you across the screen and kind of flirts with you. Um, you feel that. But then even those closest to him felt that they didn't really know him. And um, I think that's yeah, the central enigma of him, really. Charlie Chaplin was a very complicated person. He went from being very vulnerable and, um, and powerless on the streets of London, where he, he had this very poor upbringing and, um, uh, and had a lot of challenges in his childhood, to becoming the most famous person in the world, and arguably famous in a way that no one in human history had been. There's aspects of, of Chaplin's behaviour, of his relationships with, with young girls that look, we found really troubling as we've been making the film. But what we didn't want to do in the film is, I think, is flatten him or, or, try, to, or try to be too didactic about what, how the audience should feel about him. To not show something that was just black and white and to try and get beneath the, beneath the skin of that kind of um, slightly reductive, uh, I guess, silhouette uh, <laughs> that everyone knew Chaplin by and to try and... Try and create something that had volume and that had uh, complexity. Can you explain what happened during the production of the Flower Girl sequence in the movie City Lights? Wow, yes. So the Flower Girl sequence is sort of the central um, setup of City Lights, of course. The whole point is that the Tramp and the Flower Girl have to have a misunderstanding. The flower girl, who is blind, mistakes the tramp for a rich man, which is, seems like quite a simple thing to try and set up in a scene. But this problem of how to set this up in an elegant way as well, in a way where we can kind of enjoy it and then the whole film can build on this, this just sent Chaplin loopy. Um, and he spent uh, several years um, and hundreds and hundreds of takes reworking the scene. He just couldn't get it. Um, or rather, he thought the problem was different things at different times. Is it Virginia Sherrill's performance? Um, so after 270 days into the shoot, I think he fires Virginia Sherrill and tries to recast her as a different, um, different performer until he, 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 he finally comes across the, the, the genius idea of a slamming door that, that actually the tramp will, will pass through a, a car in order to avoid a policeman, slam a door, Virginia Sherrill, the flower girl, will assume that he's come out of that taxi, and then at the end of the scene, he'll get uh, someone else will slam the door. <sighs> it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm with you. Um, and um, and the mistake will be embedded because she'll try to give him the change back, um, but he'll have driven off. So she assumes, well, he must be rich and wealthy if he doesn't want this change. I've made it sound very complicated. In the film, um, the broadcaster Alice Astor Cook describes it as like water running over a pebble, and it is just this 
poetic dance in the end um, between the two of them. And it's so elegant and it unfolds so gracefully and so beautifully um, that uh, I think it warrants uh, two years and 342 <laughs> takes because I think it is one of the great moments in cinema. Probably. Oh, this is we we were out of question. Okay, cool. Ah, yeah. um, do we know who the next person is, or is that? Okay. Interview the director of the Velvet Underground. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, great. That's wow. I mean, okay. In that case, I feel we'd have to ask the question: Was Lou Reed good in interviews? Okay. I'm put that in there. And there. Cool. Well, thank you so much for having thank us. Thank you for having us. Yeah.